preparing to talk to you today, I was thinking I'm going to talk all about Grimm & Co and the community that have uh, made it happen because it's not just me, I promise you. And, and people said, no, 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 they want to hear about you as well. And I, I'm not good at that. So forgive me, but um, I'm not that great at talking about me. I don't think many of us are. Well, some of us are, um, but not all of us are. Um, so... Um, once upon a time is the beginning of most great stories and so i will talk about me that is me um that uh, my uncle did that photograph and you might notice and um, no i didn't do a photograph of the tattoos that we've had for charity but there is the g symbol up there on my arm well i actually have it on my ankle um it was something i did to raise funds for the charity i decided that people said well you'd never have a tattoo i said right okay uh let's see if we can raise some funds for charity and do that and then my husband said well if you're having it i'll have it as well so we've both got the g in somewhere on us that we can show people right so that's me. This is also me showing my belly. It's the last time I showed my belly, I promise you. Never showed it since. Um, this is my mum and my dad. Being on absolutely honest, that's the only... I'm talking about invest here because Creative Morning's the theme at the moment is invest. So I'm going to be talking about that quite a bit. The investment in me in the outset, um, you might think, oh, that's my mum, that's my dad. Uh, they invested in me no they didn't they invested in getting me up those stairs the person that invested in me um is over there in that top corner that's my grandmother um because when my parents i'm being very honest with you today because if you know if you can ask me to talk about me you're going to get full full honesty uh my grandmother um had given both my mom and her other daughter a house can you imagine um, and uh, with, she just sold everything she owned, gave them a house and moved herself into Park Hill Flats. She was an amazing woman, a fantastic woman. She was the chair of the Towns Women's Guild. She, was, she did lots of charity stuff and she was just amazing poet as well, performer. She was a comedian and, um, and she wanted her children to have the best start. So she gave everything, she, she just sold everything and gave them both a house. But then they decided that they'd be kind enough to give them, her, their child, because uh, they couldn't be bothered to bring her up. So my son <laughs> brought me up. Now that's not a problem, it's not a sad story. I was so lucky. I was the luckiest person in the world because this woman brought me up and I still got to see my mum and dad. It's not that they weren't around, it's just that they, they had too much to do. They had lots of fun loving to do. So um, they needed to <laughs> make sure that somebody who was sound could bring me up. But my nan wasn't happy with that because she'd just given up everything, moved into Park Hill Flats at the time that it wasn't so trendy. And uh, she, was, she got this little girl to bring up from a baby. And um, so it all started with that. Uh, my nan invested in me and thank goodness she did because she was amazing. Um, so everything I am today, anything I blame on her. Um, but also some of these other people, my husband up there, I've driven him to drink quite literally. Um, he's there, he's going to have to retire this year, he's just had enough. Um, there's my son there and my other son you'll see shortly, but my ex-boss there, Gina, she was amazing. Um, as a mentor and someone who invested time in me and, and what I thought, she ca cared what I thought and she let me go wild with things and develop them further and just kept piling more work on me, but it worked. Um, this is some of my team. You notice we've got a team jacket going on there. That's not on purpose. We just decided to take a photograph of it. And these are some of the women in my family who are very strong women who have been fantastic. So yes, that's actually me. Uh, and uh, the sisters of my father who were also very close to me as I was growing up. This is my best friend from school. We met at eight. Um, I lost her. She passed away five years ago during the setting up of Grimm & Co. It was one of the hardest moments dealing with that at whilst setting up Grimm & Co. But she's still very much a part of it. In fact, her photograph is on the wall and her husband is now one of our main volunteers in the building. So I had a really good upbringing. I had a really strong life. I was on track to get A's in everything. I was planning to be an English teacher and uh, take forward my nan's love of literacy and literature. And, um, and then a car crash happened. This is actually my car, but it wasn't that, it wasn't a physical car crash, it's a metaphor. The car crash that happened is my nan was already quite um, 
old when she took me on and uh, she had a heart attack so she didn't die she still she was still with me for quite a long time after that but it meant that she couldn't care for me and I was 15 so I ended up moving in with my mom and dad that was the car crash oh my goodness um, they um, they fell apart and things went very badly wrong for me for a few years so I didn't go to, I had to leave school to look after my mom because my mom and dad split up uh, my dad went off with her best friend, my mother, uh, decided that, um, well, she didn't decide anything. She, she got quite ill. So I needed to go out to work because there was lots of debt. And I didn't know what on earth I was doing. I was 15. So I got a job at a shipping agent on Effingham Street in Sheffield at uh, 15. Uh, it was illegal, completely illegal. I didn't know. I just went and got a job uh, and lied about my age. And um, so I... <laughs> So uh, I didn't go to school anymore. I left school. I didn't pass any qualifications at all. And um, so I, uh, yeah, that was the car crash. But everything has a really positive outcome. My nan was, uh, she ended up moving into a residential home where they let her run it. Uh, so she was thrilled to bits. I was okay. Eventually my mum got back on track. Everything went right. Um, but for me, what what had changed my life completely during that time is that I then went off the rails when everybody else was all all right. And I, um, I became pregnant, so I became a single parent because I was low in self-esteem, confidence, and you make all the wrong decisions when that happens to you. So uh, I made some very bad decisions for quite a while. Um, but uh, who invested in this 19-year-old? Well. The drive and ambition, not for me, but for this one here, the, my eldest, who's now 33, he's amazing. Uh, my other son is also amazing. I'll get to see a bit more of them. But uh, the energy to be a single mom, three jobs and full time at college, I was not going to go on welfare. I was going to make sure that my son had someone to look up to. I wasn't going to keep wasting my time. I was going to do things right. And uh, so I went on a secretarial course whilst doing these three jobs. I was cleaning, I was on the Bassett's twilight shift that they used to call it, uh, doing packing. And I was working behind a bar and I had another cleaning job uh, in a pub. And I also went to college and it was supposed to be a full-time course, but they let me do it part-time. So um, I did that at Parson Cross. Um, and um, someone there said to me one day, you're always helping everybody else out with their work. Have you thought of teaching? I burst into tears. It just suddenly hit me. Yes, I had always thought of teaching, but it had gone way on a back burner. But the fact that she'd said that meant that it was potentially possible. And I said to her, there's no way I could teach. It's a long time, so, you know, I haven't got any qualifications. How can I teach? And I've, I've got a son to look after. I've got to make some money now. I've got to. And she says, yes, you can. You can come on a course with us uh, that will get you on that way. And if you, if you do it like you've done this course, because I went for everything and I passed everything in the first two terms so that I could get it done. She says, if you do it like that, you'll be a teacher within two years. And I was, I was the youngest lecturer at uh, the college, Sheffield College. Um, and uh, so I was uh, teaching there, I was teaching literacy, I was working with vulnerable groups, and I loved working with vulnerable groups. Fast track forward, um, and I will fast track this. I don't know how it happened, but I ended up uh, working as a quality director for a regional consortium of training providers. And then from that became chief exec. Then from that ended up being uh, headhunted to a national role where I was head of quality for a national organization working with vulnerable children and young people. Uh, during my time, I've been a head teacher of schools, a head teacher of, uh, uh, sorry, a, a head of department at colleges. Um, the same in universities, uh, an academic, and, um, and then decided that, um, oh no, sorry, before that, and, and met people who are held up in high esteem for all sorts of things. I did have a photograph of me meeting Prince, uh, the Duke of York, but I decided not to put that one up there. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, the, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd gone somewhere. This is me in my national role being uh, congratulated for the work that was going on and, uh, and how much of a difference it was making. 
Do, because of that work, I was asked to come back to Rotherham, which is one of the places I'd worked in, to come and do a particular project, to come and have a look at uh, what would make the biggest difference to children in Rotherham in terms of their reading and writing and literacy as a whole. And there was a thought that creativity in the arts might be part of that solution. And because I'd always uh, been a champion of creativity, the arts, and, uh, uh, and being a part of the solution for vulnerable groups, and I'd proved it, which is why I was doing this there and receiving awards for it, they thought, bring, bring her back, see if we can get her to come back. So I came back on a, to Rotherham on a uh, secondment, and uh, during that secondment, I was uh, working with various groups, doing lots of research and trialling out. I had three million pounds to spend, which was a tiny budget for me at that time. Um, at that time, not anymore. And um, so I was working with that budget and doing all sorts of different projects across Rotherham and brought the University of Sheffield in to do a proper research project that told us what made the biggest difference to children and young people in Rotherham. And then if we could find out there, we could then do a strategy that would do something about this and then we could roll that out. I could change the world, It'd be amazing. So that's what I was doing. So it didn't work out like that. Those two years, I did this research, we looked into it, the University of Sheffield were amazing, and uh, we looked into what would make the difference. Oh my goodness, we found out. And I'll come back to that again in a second, but it didn't. I then presented that to people, and uh, to the right people, uh, and, but the government changed, it was 2011, everything changed. Um, so nobody wanted to hear it, nobody wanted to see the strategy. The government was a different government, so they said that wasn't on our watch. Uh, so we're not going to really listen to that because it wasn't on our watch, we didn't commission it, it wasn't our work. So, yeah, great, good, go for it. I think that's great, but we're not going to do it. Uh, the local government, I took it to them, well, we've got no money to do anything about this. I was so angry, so angry. Um, so that anger led to me leaving my national job and, uh, and, going and talking to my poor husband and saying, I'm not going to be bringing any money home for a while. I'm going to go and set something up. And it will mean I'll be doing this voluntary at first. Eventually, hopefully, I'll be paid, but I'll never be paid on this level again. It's going to be a very different lifestyle for us. And he was amazing and said, OK, all right, I believe in you. I said, I can't leave this as my legacy. We've spent three million pounds and I've left it and nothing's happened. I can't leave it. So pop-up story shop, various other things were happening at that time. That was uh, the, the um, oh, what do you call them, mascot for uh, uh, Inspire Rotherham. That was an inspiring character, of course, the pur big purple head, because pur big purple heads are inspiring characters. So lots of things happened to me on that journey. I was shot by a few Star Wars characters. And uh, then, um, so I'm just going to explain a little bit more in depth about Rotherham. Um, I don't need to explain all of this detail to you. Rotherham isn't unique, by the way. What Rotherham's unique about is a J report came out, and the J report, you, you'll have all seen, I'm sure, uh, said Rotherham had had a particular problem with child sexual exploitation, which had been horrendous. And thank goodness it came out and was exposing what had happened. But let me tell you now, this isn't a Rotherham problem. This was a problem happening all over. Rotherham, it was happening on a bigger scale, so it got highlighted, but um, it isn't only happening in Rotherham. And I met lots of people who said, God, grace, there for the grace of God go I. Somebody in Manchester, head of the police force there said, we know it's happening here just as much as it's happening there, but Rotherham got the brunt of the media publicity. What I need to remind you in that is that there's children living in Rotherham, families living in Rotherham, who have to deal with the fact that when they are outside of Rotherham on holiday, wherever they go and, and people say, oh, where are you from? And they say Rotherham. People have this immediate black cloud over the top of their heads. They didn't ask for that. And it isn't exactly uh, a, a true uh, image of what Rotherham has. But some of these things here are happening in other towns all over. This is just a, a normal, very, uh, very usual town, really, with all the same problems as many others. But it does have these things going on. And literacy was a real problem in Rotherham. So that's why Rotherham. Why children? Why, why do we think we can change things for children? We put all our store in the schools. The amount of parents I've seen who say, I don't teach my children to read and write because you know what? It didn't, I, I'm not very good at it. I'm going to leave it till they get to school to the teachers. And then that child who starts school at four is in the same class as a child who 
is, is still four, but is reading to the age of 10. How on earth are they going to feel about that school experience, no matter what you do? So you've got that happening, and you've also got the fact that outside of school time, um, there's a lot of that taking place. Look at it. In school time, 17% of children's time is spent in school when they're awake. But we put all the emphasis on their learning on teachers. But it's important that the community and the parents and the people around the parents and carers are there to support those children and give them what they need. So what brought me back to Rotherham? Why did I come back to Rotherham? Um, I came back to be the director of that funded project that I've just told you about that was two years. Um, and what that research showed, these are just some of the things it showed. This was quantitative data I could give to the government and say, you want empirical quantitative data that says this makes a difference. Creative approaches done in particular ways with this strategy make that difference. So I could show that. Like I say, I was frustrated. Um, so some elements of that philosophy that works that are really, really important. Unleashing imaginations and giving the freedom to play, courage to try. Having a go without fear of worrying that you're going to fail. Wonderland places that take the child away from their everyday, often chaotic lives. Somewhere playful but not childish, where they can enjoy themselves. The place is crucial and we found out that that was really important. One-to-one -one support and mentoring, that goes without saying what that does. A reason to write, so an, an end result, a product, performance, something at the end of it that gives children a reason to write. Energised activities with people that care and aren't switched off anymore. Teachers at the moment are shattered, they're switched off, they're, they're fed up, they're not teaching how they want to teach, they're not teaching in a way that they believe they should teach. And the children are going in to be taught by people who feel like that. That's not good. So we want to give them energised activities. We want to celebrate their writing, bring it to life in some way. For especially boys, we found that if they had a reason, a purpose to write, they were far more inclined to want to write. But also thinking about spelling, punctuation and grammar. I'll tell you that if I ask a, a group of children in a room, what's a story? What makes a great story? They'll say, fronted adverbials and uh, punctuation, full stops and, and uh, capital letters. And, oh, it's soul destroying. You think, oh no, where's the creativity gone in the way people think? So um, yeah, we need to get them back into thinking creatively. And these are just a few of the things that were in the strategy really. So why is literacy important? The links to ill health, the social exclusion, depression, Literacy is at the root of all of these things and if you really think about it, you can see it yourself. Every one of you will have seen this in your own experiences, I'm sure. So, what did we do? The model. I was looking for a model. I left my national job. I said, I'm not going back. I've got this, this strategy. I'm going to create this model, but I need lots of people on board. There was just me at that time. Um, so uh, I needed to uh, find somewhere that was a space that took every people away from their everyday chaos, provokes imagination, something authentic, a place for, ma for magical beings, not about them. That's what the kids said when I did the uh, pop-up story shop and did the consultation with them. They said it needs to be a place for magical, uh, that, that magical things happen. So that's what it was. A special place with spaces that encourage playfulness, not childishness. And Rotherham's had to be sensational. It couldn't be mediocre. Because everybody thinks of Rotherham as, and dumb it down and think of it with a black cloud. We had to make Rotherham's sensational. It had to be in Rotherham because we wanted to be close to where the children are. So enter these guys sitting in the audience, two of them are. Um, so, <laughs> so Dave and all, uh, and this is Luke. And, um, <laughs> They, uh, again, I drive a lot of people to drink when I speak to them, um, but um, they had to be the ones who helped me do this because it had to be exceptional, as I said, and I knew their work was exceptional and different, unique. So I rocked up uh, to meet with them. They let me in to start with, which was weird when I phoned up and said, I want to set up a magical shop for magical beings. Uh, it's going to have uh, products 
for sale and there's already one similar to this called the Pirate Supply Store in San Francisco and they sell planks by the foot. We're going to be selling um, all sorts of weird stuff to magical beings but they won't be weird to magical beings and humans will come in this shop as well and, um, and I need you to do the branding and design and I need you to do it for nothing. <laughs> and they let me in <laughs> and they've regretted it ever since. So um, without them it couldn't have been possible so it had to be, it had to be them. So we had a cultivation event, they, they agreed to come on board and gift their time to do this, which they did, a lot of time. They came on board, I found a place, uh, I went to the Arts Council, they gave us some funds and said okay you can have some funds toward this, so I started to get a day a week pay, so I started to get a bit of funding in, husband's smile starts to go up a little bit, um, and the, the pub that we took on was horrendous. Uh, we found all sorts of weird and nasty things in there as we were doing all this, but that's the work that was going on. This is Chris, so I started to be joined by local people saying, what are you doing? And I told them, and this is Chris, he's an artist, sculptor, writer, amazing guy. Uh, he's uh, retired early to, due to ill health, so I gave him a sander and said, sand this wall, it needs you, and he did. And um, so this is in the space with lots of people coming and saying, you're not going to do what you think you're going to do with this. And most places I went with a little suitcase full of the heebie-jeebies and things um, did say that. Uh, they said, this isn't going to happen, it's impossible. So this is what it looked like before. This is what it looked like after. So this is Grimm & Co now, um, the apothecary to the magical. The detail is everywhere in that building. This is again before, thank goodness. Uh, this is after, so this is the WC, the writer's closet, um, where you think better on the toilet, so we need to sit on the toilet. And uh, there's the toilet door with uh, famous literary quotes all over it from uh, some really special characters that we've met over the years, like Winnie the Pooh. Uh, this is another area upstairs, which is in the writer's pad. And this is now what it looks like in the writer's pad. Uh, so this is where the children that come up, they come through the secret door and they come up the stairs into this space. This is where the real magic happens for them, where they really do all the activities that we do in the charity. charity. This is what it looked like before. This is what it looks like now on the outside. Still raining, that hasn't changed. Um, and we started dispensing, this is, this is a very special day for me because tomorrow it's our first birthday in this world. In the magical world we've been able to celebrate that birthday for the last four years because it's on the 29th of February, so it doesn't exist in your world, but in the magical world it does. So we've, kept, we've had an unbirthday every year between the hours of 12 and 12.001 second and, and uh, we've just celebrated in that time. This year we can celebrate properly because the, the mortals have got it on their calendar too. So this is just some of the detail around the building, the signing, the, th the stuff that the likes of Side by Side really got and did and I could never have done. I'm an educationalist, I come from that background. I was, I've had to learn to be a retail person, I'm now learning a new skill again. But Side by Side brought their expertise in and all of this, but they didn't just bring their expertise, they came in and did it. So they were hands on with me, doing all of these labels and making it all work. Um, Magicometer, um, I brought a mobile one, it's nowhere near as good as the one in store, but if you want to have a go and see what magical being you are, at least you're better equipped then afterwards. I won't look because of GDPR rules of course, but you, you are able to have a look at your, yourselves and see what magical being you are. Uh, these are some of the products. Every product has ingredients and side effects. Uh, some examples of ingredients, the genius has uh, the extracts from the brains of the top 10 human thinkers. Uh, and, but some uh, side effects can include the sudden urge to open an independent record shop. You have to be so careful. Um, We've got fantastic patrons, a lot of patrons. We've got the likes of Joanne Harris, who wrote Chocolat, and many others. Um, and uh, re more recently joined by Matt, uh, um, 
or where, Mark Gatiss, I'm calling him Matt Gatiss, Mark Gatiss, who has, uh, you might recognise from Sherlock and other, is director, writer of many, many things. He did Dracula at Christmas and wrote it, directed it and performed in it. Jeremy and Mark uh, were two of the four of the League of Gentlemen writers and Jeremy is our writer in residence. Jeremy's very hands-on. In fact, he was with you guys in Sheffield yesterday talking about it all. So he's, he's, he, Jeremy's very hands-on. Uh, he's on the board. He's not just a patron who comes in and out. He's on the board. He's very much involved. And he's amazing. If you've ever wondered what he's like, he's fantastic. Uh, so this is a load of children going through our secret door. This is, which was, which actually when it's closed is a bookshelf, but don't tell anyone. You, you sworn to secrecy or I won't let you leave the room. All right. Um, this is the hands-on work that they did. Th this is a room full of writing. The story is all around you when this, you're in this room. It's the imagination gym. And th this is Dave and all writing the story that Jeremy wrote about our, that is the background to our story. It's when Graham Grimm started this in 1148. I can't really tell you about that story, it's take me too long. So, uh, but the story is there. Chapter two is now written and it will be available in a year's time in published format uh, in a very beautiful way, illustrated by uh, Chris Mould, also a patron. He writes for Matt Haig, he illustrates Matt Haig's books. So this is us pretending to be Charlie's Angels, um, not very well, and uh, uh, doing all of this that we were doing very much hands-on in preparing the rooms and this is what it looks like now but as you stand in that room if I could show it you all the way around that story you're inside the story as you go in the imagination gym and you have a mind oiler to because you need to exercise in the gym and you exercise your imagination so you've got a mind oiler you've got a brain duster and you've got a thought unblocker which looks suspiciously like a toilet unblocker but it's um, it is a thought unblocker of course um, so one of the big things, one of the inspirations for this model and why this model came about was a TED talk I saw by Dave Eggers in San Francisco where he'd set up this pirate supply store. Now Dave Eggers you might have heard of or you might not. When I've met with him in other countries, he is uber famous. In the UK for some reason he's not, people haven't necessarily heard of him. But he wrote uh, this screenplay for The Circle and many other things that you might have seen. He's, again, a really nice guy, really lo lovely guy, and he's, um, he's written many, many books. He's an award-winning um, writer. He set up this thing called 826 Valencia, and uh, so there's a pirate supply store, there's uh, a superhero store where you can try your cape on and make sure it doesn't bunch up when you go and have a flight. Uh, there's all these things that you can do, and, but each one has a similar model to us. It's got the the shop at the front, secret door into the writer's cafe in the back. And we've linked up with them because they're very similar in the way that we work. We're not in place because of them, but we are inspired by some of the stuff that they've done. And we're very independent of each other, but we're also a part of a lovely family. Dave came to see us, and this is why this is here. Um, he walked around in awe. He was absolutely flabbergasted. Now remember, he knows all the centers from all over the states that have been done with lots of money and lots of philanthropy. Our centre was done on the tiniest budget, with no budget almost, with lots of goodwill, lots of support, everybody volunteering. He couldn't believe it. He thought he'd be coming to somewhere that was all right. And he said this, it's simply that great and is unsurpassed in all the world. He said to us in the meeting that we had with him, he said, I really can't praise you enough. This is the gold standard. So there's now a book, a coffee table book of all the centres and, and we're in there, but he's, he said that. And I said to him, can we quote you? And he said, no, no, because all the others will be upset. And then he Instagrammed it, so, <laughs> so we could use it. So this is just...
So I decided to leave it at this is just and just let you see. Grim and Co is an experience. You have to physically experience it. It's, you, it's a, it's, it really does attack all your senses and it's important that it does. So we needed something that would do that. So they, they did it again and created this amazing place, which now we have had in seven schools. And the results from those residences of two weeks residences in seven schools have been amazing. It looks like that on the outside. The outside isn't always seen, sometimes it is. Sometimes that's buried in a classroom. So the children go on Friday, leave that classroom, shut the door, come back in on a Monday morning and they walk into that and that. And uh, there's a secret room that you go in first, a corridor, then you go into this space and, and you then explore what the artists in there are going to show you and what it is is Graham's lost his story and he can't find it his memories have disappeared so it, it addresses lots of different things on on in in that place as well as working with literacy and getting the children writing because that's what we're all about so uh, they're working in there they're finding they're putting their hands in things that are really weird they're um, they're doing all sorts of different projects in that space um, to the end result being that they want to write they see themselves as writers they're we're championing the writer in every child every one of those children has a writer inside them i'm not talking author script writer i'm talking just the ability to write because writing is everywhere there's no avoiding it there's a secret door going out there's a secret door in everywhere you everywhere you look so um some of the things that we do, as I've started to tell you, but the most important is we take fun very seriously uh, in all of these things. We run school programmes, we run out of school programmes, and all of that is, we run a programme called Unthinking, you know? You can imagine, everything's very different. It's not usual, but it all runs with the philosophy that comes out of that research and that strategy in the first place. So we've never strayed from that and we continue to do research and development constantly on everything that we do to check that it's doing what it needs to do. So, um, including Dragon's Den, which of course, <laughs> you might recognise, they've, they've been able to come in and do all sorts of things for us when we've needed them to. Um, but we can't keep relying on them to do everything, so if anybody else wants to be a dragon at any point, you are welcome to come along. Uh, find your inner dragon but dragon's den is is a literacy project we do with school children where they present back to the dragons at the end of it um, in that familiar way this was the rotherham story festival i could tell you lots about it but we're nearly end of time so i'm not going to i'm going to race through and show you all the rest of this so in the story festival that that was a tour that the children had created and written for people to go on around rotherham and see rotherham in a different light uh, we've got new blue plaques around rotherham uh, and the children's experiences are on those blue plaques rather than stuffy people from years and years ago it's it's children from now who have just experienced something <coughs> dramatic uh, that are on that tour and they wrote that tour artistic outcomes some of the things that have happened as a result of what we um, what we do, uh, again I said earlier, it's about having an artistic outcome for what they do, having a purpose to write, so these are all important. BBC Radio 4 was our latest, we were on Radio 4 as their drama um, on uh, a Monday afternoon, that was our children's scripts, but we're not like everywhere else, we, uh, we had professional artists, actors performing those scripts so they were done really beautifully and it was a proper radio for drama on uh, a Monday afternoon. So when we do any of these, we're not expecting the children to write it, dance it, sing it. They write it, that's it. They don't have to do all the others because we bring professionals in to do the others and they can see their work being experienced and appreciated by an audience of those things done at their highest level. So they see their writing come to life in the best way. So the return on investment, for me, the risks and the sacrifices, lifestyle shifts for the whole family, um, and lots of, uh, and a different lifestyle in terms of finances, a, a national ambition. My ambitions shifted completely to one, I call it one starfish at a time. I'll t uh, if you look up the starfish parable, my nan taught me that when I was very young. Uh, it's too long to tell you, but um, she taught me because she was worried about my mental health because I wanted to change the world. So I, I live my life by changing the world one starfish at a time. And if you look that parable up, you'll see what that is. She wasn't very religious, but she used it. 
Um, so this is uh, the investment, the return on investment for Dave and Al, uh, who have invested in a crazy woman with a suitcase full of the heebie-jeebies, escalating panic and cubed earwax. That's literally how I turned up to their, their studio. And uh, they've gifted already a thousand days of their time completely gifted to Grimm and Co. And I think more besides actually. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but these these slides will be available uh, for you maybe afterwards. We could see if, if so that you can read some of the the stuff on some of these about what happens and what people say. Some of the stuff that the teachers have said. This is Bernardo's, and it's a worker at Bernardo's uh, who we we do work with Bernardo's and the children who have experienced some of the most challenging things that people experience because writing is a really good tool. Um, for resilience it works really well you know diaries and all of that are really really useful but we do it in really unusual ways um, so this is just some of the activities going on in our centre some of the people um, some numbers for you uh, from December till February 9,718 children and young people from schools and, and then that's broken down for you. And then further 610 children in outreach activities and a further 874 in our outer school and holiday programmes who come time and time again and are returners. We can't meet the demands. The schools uh, are coming in their drones and it's all through uh, word of mouth. This is the sorts of things they tell each other. Again, I'll not dwell on it because of time, but um, they talk to each other and that's how we get our, we don't market what we do. We don't go out there to school saying, look at what we do, come and see us. We don't because we can't meet demand at the moment. We're booked up for the rest of the year right now and we're turning schools away right now. Um, so looking at some of this, uh, what parents say, this will all be there and hopefully we'll be able to make it so that you can see it for those that have attended today. So meanwhile, while all of this has been going on, there's been three weddings. My stepdaughter, my son, my eldest, who you saw as a baby is there now. And um, this is my other stepdaughter and her wife in uh, New York. That was an amazing wedding. Um, all of them were amazing weddings, but then there were three weddings and a dame. Uh, my son's doing really well. That's my youngest. He's a filmmaker based in London. He works for a big event company down there called Smart and uh, does, uh, but he also has his own film company and he does lots of work with various people. So that's that. These are my babies as well. Um, and uh, these are my latest babies. Uh, so the others were Tilly and George, this is Oliver, uh, Willow and the latest Elliot just a few weeks ago. Uh, next steps, the demand I've just said is far too high, we can't meet it. So the next steps, we need to build our capacity. We, our shop isn't sustainable, it does bring money in but not enough to wash its face. It's an artisan shop in Rotherham Town Centre which is suffering a lot at the moment. We need a destination, everybody that comes to us says, why haven't you got... Um, a cafe, why haven't you got a tea room? You know what, we need more to do here. We need to do more with you. Um, we also want to reach more children who are more vulnerable. So we need to upskill ourselves and build our capacity. So the next step, the future, looks like this. The National Centre for Folk and Fairy Tales is on, is on your landscape now. It's coming very soon. We've got some funding from the Arts Council towards the cost of uh, purchasing the building and now we've got to find the funds to renovate it, make it work for us. Um, and we will have cafe in there, tea rooms, a space for the whole family. It allows us to build a strong uh, foundation for, for the charity. It's a place where everyone will be welcome. Um, a safer place for children with car parking as well. This is what it looks like on the inside. Huge! We were in there yesterday, weren't we? Such fun. Um, there's a lot to do, a lot to do, but it's doable. We've done it before, we can do it again. Um, this gives you a flavour of what it might look like by the time we finish. This is a mood board of, of uh, the enchanted forest that will be inside this wonderful castle that will be there, that will be the National Centre for Folk and Fairy Tales. So this will be by this time next year. These are the sorts of images that tell you what it's going to be like. Anybody who's visited Grimm, will believe that this is definitely going to happen. It will happen. Um, I can't give too much away. You are seeing far more than most people have seen. Um, but this is the feel of the centre when you come inside. It will be a family destination with lots of activities going on across the centre. So how could you get involved or invest back in our next chapter? Um, 
there's lots of ways lots of ways these are just some of them you can volunteer and we've got some uh, scrolls up here if you wanted to support us in any way and give some of your time uh, your skills you will have skills and we need skills and people uh, fundraising for the cause my goodness we need that you know other centers and the ones that Dave Eggers runs they have philanthropy on huge levels we don't get that so any level of support that you can help us with would be really brilliant promote what we do social media and beyond people don't know our shop exists and it's online now you can buy from it so you could buy from it um, and buy our unique products some of them are here to give you a flavor um, so there's lots that you could do um, and uh, there's just one more message I'll say thank you but there's just one more message I know that um, I've talked quite a bit about side by side but there's a reason for that they're very much integral to what we do we wouldn't have done it without them um, so uh, I want to thank them and I want to also say they're, they're launching a website uh, t tomorrow today is it up there today so their website is now sidebyside.co.uk uh, so uh, it's brand new so feel free to go on there um, I know you've been working on that tirelessly for a little while so um, that's up there today so have a look and a lot of these things that you've seen up here that you've documented the making of it as well haven't you so there's blogs and things up there that you've done and created so some of those are up there or around uh, in the ether for you to look at and see how it all happened but I'm going to stop now and uh, I've gone over but I try not to so um, thank you everyone if you've got any questions I will hang about for a little while after if you've got any questions beyond what you might like to do thank you yes. <laughs>